Hello, this is Professor Russell James coming to you from the Department of Personal Financial Planning at Texas Tech University. And today I want to give another super quick lecture. Today's topic is on the secret to planned giving. Now, when most people think about planned giving, they can have a negative reaction. Isn't planned giving super complicated? Well, let's break it down. Gift planning can do two things only. And fundraisers should use it for two reasons, and financial advisors should use it for two reasons. What do I mean when I say that gift planning can do only two things? Well, fundamentally, with the 90 plus percent of all gift planning vehicles, they only do one or two or both of these two things. One, they can lower taxes, and two, they can trade a gift for income. So if gift planning can only do two things, how can it get so complicated? Well, let's start with the basic idea. One of the two things that gift planning can do is to trade gift for an income. But it depends on what kind of income do you want. Do you want income that's backed by a charity? That's called a charitable gift annuity. Do you want income that's backed by a donor asset? That's called a charitable remainder trust. Or maybe you want income that's backed by a pool of different donors' assets. That's called a pooled income fund. Uh, but it gets more complicated than that. It's not just about what the source of the income is. It depends on what kind of income you want. So if you have a charity-backed source of income, a charitable gift annuity, maybe you want an immediate fixed dollar payment for a life or lives. That's called an immediate charitable gift annuity. Or perhaps you're planning for retirement or some other expense, and you want to have delayed fixed dollar payments for life or lives. That's called a deferred charitable gift annuity. Uh, suppose you instead would prefer that income to come uh, to be backed by donor assets. Well, if you want fixed dollar payments for life or years, that's called a charitable remainder annuity trust. Maybe you want fixed percentage payments for life or years that pay a percentage of whatever's in the trust. That's called a charitable remainder unit trust. Maybe you want to have that income capped. For example, you can cap yearly income. Uh, yearly payments to income, that's called a NICRA or Net Income Charitable Remainder Unit Trust. And if you want, you can have the trust issue IOUs uh, if the income is below the fixed payment amount and to pay back those amounts later if income is higher, higher that's called a NIMCRA, Net Income Makeup Charitable Remainder Unit Trust. Or perhaps you only want that payments capped at income until a certain event occurs, such as the sale of an asset, in which case you have a flip crut. Uh, so that's how the complications can occur. The second thing that gift planning can do is to lower taxes. But lowering taxes depends upon what kind of taxes you're interested in lowering. Are you interested in lowering capital gains taxes, income taxes, estate taxes? What type of taxes are you interested in lowering? Well, if you're interested in lowering capital gains taxes, then you may be interested in giving appreciated property. Uh, you may want to give it to charity in exchange for income, such as the CRAT, CRUT, CGA, or PIF that were discussed previously. Uh, or you may just simply want to give that appreciated property to charity. Well, suppose you're not interested in lowering capital gains taxes, you want to lower income taxes. Well, whose income taxes do you want to lower? Oftentimes, this might be the donors, but if it's the heirs' income taxes, then you'll be interested in leaving retirement accounts to charitable beneficiaries who do not pay income taxes when they withdraw them, as compared with other heirs who do pay income taxes when they withdraw inherited uh, IRA or other uh, retirement accounts. But let's suppose you want to lower the donors' income taxes. Well, you can get a deduction for a current gift. You can also get a deduction for committing to a future transfer to charity. We do this in a private foundation, donor advised fund, grant or charitable lead trust, or remainder interest deed. Or you can have a deduction for current gift in exchange for income. So even those, uh, those gifts that produce income, they also produce a tax deduction. But maybe you're interested in lowering estate taxes. Well, then you can simply give things to charity at death, either through a will or through a charitable remainder trust, charitable gift annuity, or remainder deed. You can also uh, give fixed payments from assets to charity, and the excess growth goes to the heirs' estate tax-free using a non-grant or charitable lead trust. So gift planning can only do two things. All it can do is to lower taxes or trade a gift for income. But as you see, things can get complicated. All of these different options come together, and although it only does two things, there are so many different options, sometimes people get overwhelmed by the number of options. But let's get back to the simple reality. The simple reality is that gift planning can only do two things. It can lower taxes, and it can trade gift for income. 
Fundraisers should use gift planning for two reasons. Number one reason is if you are asking for cash, you are asking small. Number two reason is if you ever have a donor who says the magical phrase, "I wish I could do more, but." If you're asking for cash, you're asking small. Why is that? Well, that's true because wealth is not held in cash. Wealth is held in assets. So if you're asking from the cash bucket, you're asking from the small bucket. If we take a look at how families hold financial assets, only about one percent. Are held in cash or cash equivalents, such as checking accounts, saving accounts, money market deposit accounts. Ninety-nine percent of wealth held by families is held、uh, in other financial assets: stocks, bonds, retirement accounts, life insurance, mutual funds. And this doesn't even take into account real estate and other non-financial assets that are also、uh, substantial parts of family wealth. The second reason to use gift planning for fundraisers is if you ever hear the magical phrase "I wish I could do more, but," such as "I wish I could do more, but I have to save for retirement," "I wish I could do more, but I'm on a fixed income," or "I don't have ca- the cash right now," or "Everything is tied up in the business or the farm," or "Maybe I'll leave a gift in my will," "I wish I could do more, but I only have so much money and I might live a really long time," etc., etc. The magical phrase "I wish I could do more, but." Has a magical response. The magical response is, "What if there was a way you could do both? Would you like to hear about that?" Let me give you an example. This is a simple way to ask from the big bucket instead of asking from the cash bucket, which is the small bucket. If a donor is interested in giving a hundred thousand dollars in cash to the charity at top tax rates, that can generate a maximum income tax deduction worth thirty-nine thousand six hundred dollars. That's great. But if instead we were able to get the donor to transfer a hundred thousand dollars of highly appreciated stock, the donor gets two tax advantages. They still get the same thirty-nine thousand six hundred dollar income tax deduction, but in addition, they avoid capital gains tax. And supposing they paid ten cents on the dollar for this asset, that avoids another twenty-one thousand two hundred and forty dollars in capital gains tax just at the federal level. So suppose there is a donor who says, "Well, I do have the stock to give; it's highly appreciated, but I don't want to give you the stock because I'd like to hold on to it and stay invested in it." That's not a problem. You simply encourage the donor to do a charitable swap. In a charitable swap, the donor takes the hundred thousand dollars they were going to give to the charity, and instead they use that hundred thousand to immediately buy identical stock. Uh, that is、uh, replacing the stock that they gave to the charity. So they take a hundred thousand dollars of stock, they give it to the charity, they take the cash they would have gone given to charity, and instead they use it to purchase that those、uh, shares of stock from the open market. This is perfectly allowed. There's no wash sale rule because this is gain property, not loss property. What's the big deal? The big deal is before this donor owned a hundred thousand share, hundred thousand dollars of stock with a ten thousand dollar basis, meaning that if he sells it, he's going to have to pay capital gains tax on ninety thousand dollars. But now the donor owns a hundred thousand dollars of the stock with a one hundred thousand dollar basis, so he has for free gotten this special tax advantage simply by giving stock rather than by giving cash. This is a free tax benefit that the donor loses every time the donor gives cash instead of appreciated securities. But perhaps the、uh, the charity does not know how to accept securities or only wants to take cash. Not necessarily a problem. All the donor has to do is create a donor advised fund so that the stock can be transferred to the donor advised fund, and then the donor advised fund can、uh, issue checks from it to the charities, so the ch- the charity never actually sees the assets. Gift planning can do two things: it can lower taxes and it can trade a gift for income. Financial advisors should use it for two reasons: number one, to provide dramatic benefit to highly desirable clients, and number two, to increase multi generational assets under management. Estates, including charitable planning by estate size, this increases dramatically as estates grow. As people become wealthier, they are more and more likely to include charitable planning. So, for financial advisors who are interested in advising clients at the high end, it makes sense to be able to provide these benefits by becoming knowledgeable about charitable planning. 
So as a quick example, uh, suppose a client has an asset that does not produce income that is highly appreciated. They want to sell that asset and they want to convert it into an income producing asset. Well, if you don't know anything about charitable planning, and uh, even if you have clients who already have a charitable plan, already have interest in leaving money to a charity in at death, you might simply say, okay, let's sell it, pay the capital gains tax, and invest the rest. Well, that's going to leave, depending upon what state you're in, if it's a million-dollar asset, there's only $722,000 left after paying those capital gains taxes to invest but you don't have to pay those taxes. If prior to the sale, the donor decides to put it into a charitable remainder trust, that $1 million asset can be sold with, sold with no capital gains taxes. The donor can take income off of it uh, for his life and any other lives that he may wish to identify. In addition to which, not only does the donor not have to pay capital gains tax, the donor actually gets a substantial tax deduction of worth at least $100,000 through the transaction. Not only does this mean the donor comes out better, but it means the financial advisor is managing well over a million dollars rather than only managing $722,000. Not only is the advisor managing more, but that amount will continue to grow even more rapidly because this is a tax-free growth environment. Growth inside a donor-advised fund is tax-free. Growth inside a charitable remainder trust is also tax-free. There's only taxation when money is distributed out to the uh, donor or other non-charitable recipient. Growth inside a private foundation is very tax-limited. It's taxed at either a 2% or a 1% rate. And finally, financial advisors may be interested in charitable planning to allow for multi-generational management. If instead of setting up a uh, private foundation or donor advised fund, the, uh, the client simply uh, divides the inheritance among the children, oftentimes you're left with no pool of assets that the original financial advisor is going to be able to manage. The pools are much smaller after division by the number of children and reduction by estate taxes. It's unlikely that the advisor is going to have an individual relationship with each heir and, of course, any Downturns in the market require a great deal of maintenance and hold ha hand holding because these are personal losses. In contrast, if the client sets up a substantial private foundation or donor advised fund, this is a large pool that is not reduced by estate taxes, is not subject to division among all of the heirs, and the manager has a pre existing position as pool manager so that when the client uh, passes on, it, it makes sense to keep the same financial advisor managing those assets. These are much lower maintenance relationships because any losses are losses to a charitable organization rather than losses coming out of the pocket of that particular individual. So that's it. Gift planning can only do two things. Fundraisers should use it for two reasons, and financial advisors should use it for two reasons. That's the secret to understanding plan giving. It can get a lot more complex than this, but it all comes down to these simple things. So now that you know the secret to understanding plan giving, there's no reason not to use it, and no reason not to jump in and learn a little bit more about the details of plan giving so that you can help out your donors and your clients.